Uh, I'm going to show you in order the books I wrote and why I wrote them. The first book actually wrote itself. When I finished school teaching, I was filled with fury at the 30 years of my life I had devoted to this institution. I had trouble going to sleep at night because I was so angry and I had trouble getting up in the morning and greeting the new day. I woke up angry and I went to bed angry at night. So I thought I'd discharge some of this anger by trying to catch lightning in a bottle, trying to make the experience of 30 years fit into an essay called The Psychopathic School in which I described the pathologies I thought grew out of this kind of confinement experience. Uh, I had no sooner written that and used it as a, a Teacher of the Year speech when a little magazine reprinted it and somehow the magazine got to India and I got a call from Nehru University saying they would like to use the talk as the graduation address. And furthermore, they'd like to publish the talk as a, as a little book, a chap book, but that it was kind of skimpy to fill a whole book. Did I have a few other essays that could wrap around it, could be a setting for the psychopathic school? Well, I thought about that. And it occurred to me that as I described the pathologies of that that school children display to an incredible degree, I hadn't written about my part in creating those pathologies. And so I wrote a second speech, which actually became the New York State Teacher of the Year speech, and it was published elsewhere. And soon there were 700 versions of it circulating the world there. So I had done a piece of the undone work by fingering myself and my colleagues in our, our role in creating these pathologies. There were other aspects of the school business that weren't so obvious as crazy children and crazy school practices. And I thought I owed it to a book to deal with those two. So in five different ways, I distilled my school experience and it became dumbing us down the hidden curriculum of compulsory schooling. And even though the publisher was a small publisher and never spent a nickel on advertising the book, word of mouth has caused to date 150,000 copies of this book to sell. The second book, The Exhausted School, and here you see me when I was a little bit lighter in weight in 1991, in white tie and tails, the only occasion for me ever to wear white tie and tails in my life. I've worn a tux a number of times. This is on the stage at Carnegie Hall. Uh, I had just exited the teaching business in July. And I wanted some way to make a public mark, sort of to draw my toe in the sand in some public arena and throw down a gauntlet to the school business. Now, it's bizarre to think of a junior high school teacher 
went in Carnegie Hall in New York City to do that. But I knew if the venue wasn't celebrated, I sure wasn't celebrated. So there wasn't much likelihood of this gauntlet ever being picked up and examined. Fortunately, some of my former students came up with the money to hire Carnegie Hall. If you're ever planning to do that, I want you to know that it's the most heavily unionized concert hall, I'm sure, in the world. There are thousands of pages of union regulations. If you go 60 seconds over the limit of your performance, you owe $15,000 more. If you want a piano on the stage to play a number, that's $6,000. We did pay that, and we had Mozart as the backdrop as the audience came in, and during the intermission at the end as they went out. I said, as long as I'm going to get into a monkey suit of white tie tails, I may as well go whole hog. And anyway, it wasn't my money. Is an out school teacher for you. Uh, the exhausted school wasn't a solo performance at Carnegie Hall. I drew together, I believe, six alternatives to institutional schooling that were up and running and were quite successful. And I wanted the audience to see that there were a whole variety of ways to do this education thing. So uh, my own words are about a third of this book, and the remaining two-thirds come from the Holt people in Boston and from the Waldorf people from their training college in upstate New York and from other examples of a different way to do this thing. The third book I wrote, also wrote itself. This is an assemblage of speeches I made between 1992 and 1999, each one of which attempts to examine some aspect of this wacky institution. Now, every piece of this will resonate with some part of your consciousness if you went to public school. In other words, my goal is not to tell you things that you don't know in this book. It's, in fact, to have you ask yourself, I've known this for years. Why haven't I done something about it? Uh, I hope someday to combine dumbing us down and a different kind of teacher and have a, a book-sized book. The last book took 10 years to write. I began it slowly in 1991, and by 1993, I was working around the clock, seven days a week, January the 1st to December 31st. It was the principal activity of my life, the underground history of American education, which is 310,000 words long, and in fact, at one time, was 600,000 words long. When I looked at this pile of TypeScript pages, I said, nobody is going to work their way through this book. So I picked out hunks of it and threw it away. But the 310,000 words that remain constitute a mosaic that adds up to an explanation of all the inexplicable aspects of schooling, from standardized testing to grading to a trivialized curriculum, and on and on. I worked 10 years of digging, at least 2,500 books read, many, many, many hundreds of interviews, lots of reflection. It's, it's a full-time job of 10 years. 
And oddly enough, I'm still working at it. The next edition should be out in 60 days. It probably will have the same cover, even though I purchased different cover art. I don't want to delay bringing this edition out. And the next edition has substantial changes in it, even though this earlier edition and the one that preceded it capture the argument and prosecute it the same way. I've I simply dug a little bit deeper. Also, I corrected the misspelled words and the bad grammar, which is very embarrassing for an English teacher. Uh, so I, I'd like to read a little bit of the table of contents of this book so you can get some sense of how it differs from from the first three were were really personal expressions based on on the site observations, a bit of research, more than a bit, a fair amount, but it was fresh from the job. This is an old turtle's reflection on these the questions these first three books raised. And what I've done in the table of contents is to basically list the main ideas that are in each chapter in an old-fashioned bookish way. That I won't bother to bother you with. But I wrote a little epigraph before each chapter that tries to catch the kernel, the thematic kernel in that chapter. And those, I think, might whet your appetite to work your way through a 310,000-word book. The first chapter is the prologue, and the epigraph for the prologue is the shocking possibility that dumb people do not exist in sufficient numbers to warrant the millions of careers devoted to tending them will seem incredible to you. Yet that is the central proposition of my book, that mass dumbness which justifies official schooling, first had to be dreamed of. It isn't real. First chapter is called The Way It Used to Be, and in that I attempt to reach back into American history and show the contrast between the expectations of young people growing up 200 years ago in this country, not globally, and what we're doing today. And the epigraph for the way it used to be is our official assumptions about the nature of modern childhood are dead wrong. Children allowed to take adult responsibilities and given a serious part in the larger world are always superior to those who are passively schooled. At the age of 12, Admiral Farragut got his first command. I was in fifth grade when I learned of that. Had Farragut attended my elementary school in Monongahela, he would have been in seventh grade. Chapter two is called An Angry Look at Modern Schooling. And the epigraph is, the secret of American schooling is that it doesn't teach the way children learn, and it isn't supposed to. It took seven years of continuous reading and reflection to finally figure out that mass schooling of the young by force was a creation of the four great coal nations of the 19th century. That's the United States, Germany, Britain, and France. Nearly a hundred years after the investiture of forced schooling in the United States, on April the 11th, 1933, the president of the Rockefeller Foundation announced to insiders that a comprehensive national program was underway to control human behavior. 
as I speak to you, that was 70 years ago. Chapter 3, the schools, of course, were the agency to do that. Chapter 3, called Eyeless in Gaza, is about the elimination of the ability to read complex material. And I specify exactly how that was carried out. Something strange has been going on in government schools where the matter of reading is concerned. Abundant data exists to show that by 1840, the incidence of complex literacy in the United States was between 93 and 100 percent wherever such a thing mattered. Yet compulsory schooling existed nowhere. Between the two world wars of the 20th century, schoolmen seem to have been assigned the task of terminating our universal reading proficiency. And to spare you reading this chapter, I will tell you that under the guise of World War II, the alphabet system of teaching reading, which had worked quite brilliantly and very efficiently for hundreds and hundreds of years, was jettisoned, and it was replaced with a pictograph system where you were required to memorize the look of words rather than to sound out the parts of words. It's a system that simply doesn't work well. It works well enough for you to become an indifferent reader, but never well enough for you to pick up the books that the people who made schooling were familiar with. Chapter 4 explains why I quit, how I eventually became disgusted with what I was doing, even though I was highly honored by the system and given many, many privileges. I became so disgusted with what I was doing that I quit. I lived through the great transformation of the 1960s and watched schools turn from reasonably useful places into laboratories of state experimentation upon children, centers of scientistic pornography masquerading as pedagogical science. Treating children as individuals became anathema. The changeover was the fruit of a half century of social theory in which experts in child development spoke in averages. But there is no mass of children, only individual children. The entire great scam of sociology dealing in social averages is a hideous way to look at your family or your neighbors. There are no average children, and all the stage theories of child development, depending on averages, will bring you to grief if you attempt to employ them, either with your family at home or in school. The evidence of our eyes and ears demonstrate that average men and women do not exist. It's a statistical conceit that justifies management. In Chapter 5, which is the second part of the book, I try to discover and uncover the foundations of schooling and also the kind of human temperament that would lead to this this fashion of an institution. This chapter is called True Believers in the Unspeakable Chautauqua. I took the uh, locution True Believers from a, a book by Eric Hoffer, the San Francisco longshoreman who had a, a vogue in the national eye 
of about five years, in I believe the early 1960s, he wrote these very slim, highly intellectual, and quite fresh, freshly thought uh, considerations of American national life. And his last book, and probably his most famous, which has been continuously in print for the last 40 years, is The True Believer. The expression actually comes from uh, St. Augustine in a book about, uh, about war, I believe. From start to finish, school as we know it is a tale of true believers and how they took the children to a land far away. All of us have a tiny element of true believer in our makeup. You have only to reflect on some of your own wild inner urges and see the lunatic gleam that comes into your own eye on those occasions to begin to understand what happens when obedience to those kinds of impulse are made a permanent condition of management. Chapter 6 goes even deeper into this true belief phenomenon and examines the utopian impulse as it occurred globally, but as it particularly occurred in the United States. In the middle of the 19th century, we had well in excess of 1,000 utopian colonies all over the United States. And just, just for pure pleasure, I'd urge you to pick up one of the many books available that deal with the different sorts of utopian community. Because the experimentation on human nature that was undertaken in those communities was borrowed. It was abstracted and utilized by government agencies. The lure of utopia, presumably humane utopian interventions, like compulsion schooling, which is supposed, after all, to be for the good of children, aren't always the blessing they appear to be. For instance, the invention of the safety lamp saved thousands of coal miners from gruesome death, but it wasted many more lives than it ever rescued, because without that invention, the coal industry would have always remained a peripheral business. They would scrape the surface and leave the rest of it alone. The safety lamp allowed the subterranean depths of the earth to be dug out in little narrow tunnels and the miner to be relatively safer in those tunnels than he would have been, but if he hadn't have been able to see in those tunnels, he never would have gone into them in the first place. The lamp alone allowed the coal industry to grow rapidly, exposing miners to mortal danger from which there is no good protection. In the year 2000, after an era of safety lamps and other scientific progress, 6,000 miners were lost to cave-ins and explosions in Russia alone. That's twice the death toll of the World Trade Center disaster in New York. What Sir Humphrey Davy, the inventor, accomplished with his lamp was a great gift, but not to coal miners. It was a great gift to coal producers. Chapter 7 tracks the kind of schooling that you and I are familiar with right back to its original uh, production center, which was the militaristic state of Prussia in northern Germany. And from Prussia, delegations from all over the world, east and west, came to see the Prussian miracle, where a small, poor country could produce... Uh, profitable factories, and in particular, a very well-disciplined and formidable army simply by passing 
its citizen, its young citizenry through forced schooling. And from Prussia, Horace Mann returned to the United States and Japanese investigators returned to Japan and they installed the Prussian system where it would do the most good from the managerial point of view. In 1935, at the University of Chicago's experimental school, this is the epigraph for Chapter 7, The Prussian Connection. In 1935, at the University of Chicago's experimental school, where John Dewey had once held sway and made his reputation, the head of the social science department published an inspirational textbook called The Life and Work of the Citizen. In its pre-publication edition, and this is the one I'm talking about, if you get the publication edition, what I'm going to tell you about will have been muted. The title page clearly shows four interlocked hands interconnected to form a swastika. And the markings throughout the book for the chapter divisions and also for inner chapter divisions are done with the fascist emblem, the bundle of sticks held by an eagle. By 1935, the Prussian pattern and Prussian goals had embedded themselves so deeply into the vitals of American institutional schooling that hardly a soul noticed that the traditional purposes of this pedagogical enterprise were being abandoned. If you remember from another part in this film, the traditional purposes were to develop good people, good citizens, and to make each individual his or her personal best. Those were replaced by a fourth purpose that comes to us directly from Prussia, and that is that school would be uh, school would be an assistant to the economy and to the government, and therefore school children should be looked upon as human resources, not as individual spirits. I'm sure that to no one watching this will the term human resources not be familiar. That was the Prussian outlook on people. Chapter 8 nails the origination of forced schooling in the fashion that we have it to coal mines and the coal mining powers. A dramatic shift to mass production and mass schooling occurred in the very same moment in history and they are definitely intimately related with one another. Mass production actually isn't really possible, certainly not the way we conceive of it, without an endless source of energy, which absolutely prior to coal was not available anywhere in the world. Winds come and go. Water ebbs and flows. But coal power can go on at the steady rate around the clock. Suddenly, mass production truly became possible. But to have people effectively work at mass production, and even more importantly, consume the usually somewhat inferior standardized products of mass production, you have to have a different kind of human being than through than threw the British out of the United States and were working for independent livelihoods in this country. This chapter, chapter 8, is called A Coal-Fired Dream World. A dramatic shift to mass production and mass schooling occurred in the same heady rush. Mass production could not be rationalized unless the public accepted massification. In a democratic republic, school was the only reliable long-range instrument 
available to accomplish this. Older American forms of schooling would not have been equal to the responsibility which coal, steam, steel, and machinery laid upon the national leadership. Coal demanded the schools we have, and of course oil, which displaced coal in the center of our affections also. And so we got these schools as an ultimate act of economic rationality. Chapter 9 deals with the kind of mentality which evolved in order to, to make efficient the heavy use of machine interventions in human life. It goes by the seemingly harmless expression scientific management. And between 1890 and 1920, it was as close to being a national religion as anything you could imagine. Time and motion studies, which we have with us today, that determine that if a woman keeps her elbow at this angle rather than this angle, she will produce 20% less assembled pieces on the production line is just one of the hundreds and hundreds of, of relics of the scientific management period we have with us. But people who are knowledgeable about this usually aren't knowledgeable about it. It didn't stay in the production arena, in the uh, industrial arena, but it leapfrogged almost immediately into the churches, into the schools, into every aspect of American life. Managers came to judge themselves and others judged the managers on the basis of how scientifically they managed. Frederick Taylor was the high priest of scientific management, and he's certainly somebody that you should delve into, read a biography or two, and you will find probably the principal architect of the world you live in. In the past, Frederick Taylor wrote, he was the uh, scientific management engineer for the Carnegies and the Rockefellers. In the past, Frederick Taylor wrote, man has been first. By the way, he also invented the slip-on shoe because it was more efficient than a shoe that had to be tied. Uh, in the past, Frederick Taylor wrote, man has been first. In the future, system must be first. The thought processes of the standardized worker had to be standardized too in order to render him a dependable consumer. Forget efficiency in production if you can't get efficiency in consumption. Now think about that for just a short instant. The most efficient consumption system would have people consuming all the time and expending all their earnings and all their savings on consumption. Have I described the United States at the beginning of the 21st century, but the only way you can get continuous consumption is by maintaining a constant low level of boredom so that nothing people buy is satisfactory for other than the first few moments after the purchase. Think only of your computer, which you know even if you bought it today as you listen to me, it's already obsolete because none of the computer companies would release a generation of computers if they didn't already have the replacement generation in hand. Read Tracy Kidder's The Soul of a New Machine and find out where that philosophy evolved from. At the minute the sales curve for whatever the, the you know, the AC Ducey machine you bought is, whenever the sale curve reaches, is that called the asymptote, David, the top, 
and starts down, at that moment, the drums begin to roll for the generation that was available at the moment you purchased this generation. And it is tooled up and moved on to scene. Of course, its replacement, too, stands in the wings waiting for for you to continuously consume and be dissatisfied with this machinery. The same thing's true of automobiles. It's true of everything because that's the logic of scientific management. You have to reach a point in human life where everything and anything machines make will be consumed enthusiastically. Well, they make an awful lot of stuff. Fortunately, the United States of America is there to consume it. Uh, chap the, that, that's the end of uh, the third part of the book. The fourth part of the book is simply one chapter. It's a personal interlude about my own family and upbringing in a coal mining town in western Pennsylvania. And if you had taken my family and put them under modern social work scrutiny. This is both my father's family and my mother's family. I would have grown up in social service work in a foster home and all of the people I knew who were all wonderful wacky geniuses who fought constantly, they would have all been locked up. And if I were the victim of those things that I'm told victimize people when I read the, the, the various child-saving manuals, then I would not have been able to live an adult life, to own a farm, to become the New York State Teacher of the Year, to write four books, and to make a movie to be married to the same woman after 43 years. The truth is, like schooling, our insight into, into the mind of the developing young, A, is based on averages. Even the averages are suspect there. I suppose I can't tell you that I believe that spare the rod and spoil the child is probably as accurate, as accurate a, a piece of folk wisdom as anything else. It's not a hundred percent accurate, but certainly was accurate in, in, in my place. Nor do I look at anyone who applied the rod to my anatomy with anything other than love and gratitude. All right, that was my Green River. And and why I throw that in is not uh, uh, for some personal display, but simply to show a personal contradiction to, to sociological wisdom and psychological wisdom as it's been packaged and, and vended to us. Uh, Part four of the book is called Metamorphosis. I try to show the change from an earlier traditional libertarian society. It's interesting because that's almost a contradiction in terms. We hardly have a record of a libertarian society in the West or the East. Where the models came from were American Indian tribes who didn't have a ladder of authority the way Hollywood shows with the top guy having all the feathers in his hat. But very often the chief ships were exchanged. They were drawn by lot. And if that sounds bizarre to you, let me tell you that all of the leading positions in classical Greece were drawn by lot. If you wouldn't put your name in the hat or whatever container they used, then you weren't fit to be a citizen of Athens. And if they needed a water commissioner, all the citizen names were available, and the one they drew out was the water commissioner. And how about general of the armies? Exactly the same way. 
not a professionalized lifelong career, but it was assumed that a citizen would have the competency to do anything after a short trial period. And that to be a citizen, you had to have a crack at all the major responsibilities. Otherwise, you weren't worth dealing with. You were a slave. I think that might be a fresh perspective on the 21st century. Uh, chapter 11 is, call, is called The Crunch. And in, in it, I deal with the very rapid conversion from an older kind of society to, to what we have now after the American Civil War. Chapter 12 deals with how power really flows in the United States. It's one of my favorites. It's called Daughters of the Barons of Runnymede. And I picked that at random out of a book of, of elite hereditary societies in the United States. The Daughters of the Barons of Runnymede are not one of the most influential, but they're the ones that caught my heart and my tickled my funny bone best. You can't be a member of the Daughters of the Barons of Runnymede unless you can show direct descent from one of the 12 barons who forced King John to knuckle under to the nobility back in 1215. That's an American organization, but it probably has outriggers around the world. And here's the funniest part of the Daughters of the Barons of Runnymede. Just because you can show direct descent doesn't mean you get into the inner circle of the club. The only people who are allowed in the inner circle of the daughters are people who descend from one of the barons who had some special knightly decoration. The rest of them are just common fodder, even though they've traced their ancestry for 800 years. Now, my levity aside, there are extremely important hereditary societies in the United States. The Order of the Cincinnati is one of them. I'll probably be shot for even telling you about it. The Order of the Cincinnati is made up of those people who can trace their descent from a field grade officer in the American Revolution. And when it had its meetings after the Civil War, not only did every major northern general show up, but every major southern general showed up too. Uh, the new compulsion school institution was assigned the task of fixing the social order in place. But it it borrowed the cautions that two Italian sociologists, Vilfredo Pareto and Gian Battista Mosca, had laid down around 1900. Both these men, working independently, said the reason that every uh, uh, hierarchy comes to an end is the problem of transmitting to the next generation the reins of power. And what causes this, these breakups to happen is that in reality, there really isn't any difference in talent or intelligence between the aristocracy and the common herd. And as you frustrate the natural leaders of the common herd, they band together, and over time, it may be centuries, they figure out where the weak spots of your edifice are, and all of a sudden they upset it. And both these men, working independently of one another, said that the way out of this trap is to put young children through every stage of their life under close scrutiny 
And the minute you see signs that someone might potentially become a later adversary, you draw that kid into the reward system of the aristocracy. You flatter that kid. You wean that kid away from his own parents. And in that way, the secret of perpetual power would be available for the first time in human history. So the next time you see some kid from Harlem on the cover of Time magazine on his way to Exeter or Andover, you might just ask your local librarian to get you Mosca or Pareto. But the daughters of the barons are running me represent the over well over a thousand uh, private hereditary societies that are really like a cousinage, an international cousinage that exists apart from almost any form of scrutiny the outgroup can bring to bear. Chapter 13 was the, is called The Empty Child, and that was originally the title of this monster book, The Empty Child. It has to do with the contributions of psychology and philosophy to this, this pot of this leadership pot. The basic hypothesis of utopia building, and of obviously what we're running is a utopia here may not be a utopia for you, but let me tell you, it's a utopia for, dare I say, the Bush family or the Clinton family. The basic hypothesis of utopia building is that the structure of personhood can be broken and reformed again and again, that people are plastic or that they're empty and can be filled according to specification. The notion that children were empty vessels was the most important concept which inspired social architects and engineers to believe that schools could be remade into socialization laboratories under central mandate. Chapter 14, in some ways, is my favorite chapter in the book because it originated in a speech I gave immediately after the Dalai Lama spoke in Boulder, Colorado. And I had sat directly in front of the Dalai Lama staring in his eyes while he spoke. And when he was done, I got up and spoke to a tent full of people who I think paid $500 a ticket to get in, certainly not to see me. But I was inspired to reach some kind of height beyond the ordinary. I must have taken 90 days to write this talk. It's called Absolute Absolution. And it deals with the necessity of throwing God out of government schooling. God was pitched out of government schooling on his ear after World War II. This was not because of any bogus constitutional prohibition, at least not one that the previous century and a half could detect, but because the new state and the new economy considered the Western spiritual tradition too dangerous a competitor to be allowed, and of course it is. When you issue a wild card to every citizen, that says you may appeal beyond the decision of our managers and experts to an invisible guide, you're dealing with a situation so unstable that sensible architects knew it had to be gotten rid of. What I'm most proud about in this article, though, is is you can't just throw God out. What you have to do is find a way to replace the functions that God serves. 
I can't give you a religious lecture here, but obviously one of those functions is to deal with the inevitable universal aging, sickness, and death that we all will encounter. But you can move into place a large, minutely articulated medical apparatus and system that more or less, without actually saying it, promises that everything can be taken care of, including death. It's just a matter of time, isn't it? Until we don't have to die. It seems to me I hear that message daily from the medical system. And there are other things, that, the functions. God holds your hand when you realize that paying the penalty of uh, of uh, the forbidden fruit in Genesis, that you're going to have to labor by the sweat of your brow for your bread. Well, no, you don't. You live in the United States. Only fools work. Don't you get stock options, or aren't you in a privileged occupation where the idea of... Uh, uh, of, of your resources shriveling up don't exist. They constantly renew themselves there. You don't have to work. Only fools work. Smart people have other people work for them, or they employ machinery. We're not fighting a war in Iraq. Our machines are so superior to the Iraqi machines, which, by the way, we sold, sold them, so it's our new generation of machines against our older generation machines, that I think we should award the medals to our machinery in, in, in appropriate ceremonies. Anyway, absolute absolution deals with the problem of God, why spirits are dangerous, and what actually the Western outlook on, on religion teaches. It's, it's, it's an amazing code of easily accessible strengths. Chapter 15 is the psychopathology of everyday schooling. None of the familiar school sequences, none of them, are defensible by any of the known rules of evidence. You could not bring a case to court that this has to be this way or the division into social studies and so has to be that way. They're quite indefensible. They're all arbitrary, because you have to do something as long as you're going to confine these kids. They're all grounded in superstition or class propaganda or aesthetic or philosophical prejudices of one sort or another. For instance, and this I think will be directly useful to you if you're a, if you're a homeschooler, Pestalozzi's famous formula of simple to complex is a prescription for disaster in the classroom. This is not the way people learn. They learn from a kind of random selection up and down the ladder that keeps them feeling the zest of the chase. And sometimes, very often, you can reverse the ladder, and it works just as well. In fact, there were famous experiments. I have to tell you this. I hope I can remember the name. If I can, it was Penn State University in central Pennsylvania. In the years, I believe, were the middle 70s. Uh, I'm reaching, but this old mine. But these are quite famous experiments. The Pennsylvania State University Psych Department took the physics textbook for freshman physics, which I believe was a required course so that all freshmen had to take it, and they scrambled the pages at random, mind you. So often you'd get to the end of the page, and you'd be on a different concept in the middle of a sentence than the former concept. And they applied that. This is some more evidence of 
the way schools are used as laboratories of experimentation. They applied that to a few sections of the freshman physics course, and everybody else got the regular, careful, simple to complex ladder system. On the standardized examinations that measured supposedly proficiency in physics knowledge, there was no difference at all between the group that got a textbook that was made up of pages that had just been put together at random versus the ones who had the scientifically organized and, and a rational thing. But I had too much experience with kids, and I had too much bad experience with simple to complex in my own life and also my teaching career, not to say, you're nuts if you buy that build. Uh, the last part of the book is called The Prison of Modern Schooling. And chapter 16, I believe there's 18 chapters in my book, so we're near the end. Yes. Chapter 16 is called A Conspiracy Against Ourselves. Spare yourself the anxiety of thinking of this school thing as a conspiracy, even though the project is riddled with petty conspirators. It was and is a fully rational transaction in which all of us play a voluntary part. That is, you can step off this treadmill at any moment you want and actually do this education thing the right way. You can just step off the treadmill and, and walk away. It was and is a fully rational transaction action and you play a voluntary part in it. You trade the liberty of your kids, as all of us trade our free will, for a stable social order and a prosperous economy. Now, I want to modify that a little bit. We had a prosperous economy in every single phase of American history. It's just that the corporate economy is much more prosperous than the economy of independent livelihoods, which is to say more stuff is available and more legal tender to buy the stuff with is available under the corporate system. The cost is your mind and your character to have that extra bit of stuff. Uh, the society is much more stable than it would be because no one knows how to rock the boat or very few people know how to rock the boat there. And when you look in earlier periods of American society, it was always turbulent because it was supposed to be turbulent. That's what they failed to tell you in social studies, that the whole American charter is meant to provoke constant argument. It's meant to make doing anything that changes the past difficult to do. It's a test of whether it's really worth doing that we make it so hard to do. For the Supreme Court to cooperate with the White House, to cooperate with both houses of Congress, is a nightmare. That's exactly what we fled when we came here, of course, you can't argue very effectively unless your mind is developed and your understanding and your insight, unless you can speak in public and write in public. That's why we don't bother to let you know how to do those things, even though they're child's play to do. Because then you'd be able to argue effectively you would restore the America of Andrew Jackson. Who wants that? Not Unilever, I can tell you. Not Coca-Cola, I can tell you. Not General Dynamics, I can tell you. Why would they want that kind of competition, that kind of obstructionism? So it's a conspiracy against ourselves. You and I have entered into a devil's bargain 
in which most of us agree to live our lives through as children. We may be a little bit less childish than the actual children, but not much. The self-same tutelage which freezes the young into place in exchange for food, entertainment, safety, political simplification affects both the grown-ups here and the adults. The contract fixes the goal of human life so low that students go mad trying to escape it. Of course, the struggles are largely over by the end of the teen years. That has nothing to do with the claims of hormones and biology. It's the light that goes out of your eyes or goes out of your house pet's eyes when it realizes that it's never going to be allowed to go out into the world. Chapter 17 is the nitty-gritty. It's the politics of schooling. And I wrestled with this idea for literally years trying to find some way to communicate the brilliant invention that keeps us static, that keeps school reform producing the same thing we had before we reformed the schools. At the heart of the durability of mass schooling is a brilliantly designed power fragmentation system which distributes decision-making so widely among so many warring interests that large-scale change is impossible without a guidebook. You have to know who actually holds the actual string of power. I'll give you a hint. It's never the teacher's union, regardless of what you hear. Ain't true. The power is fragmented into 18 separate compartments, that I, each one of which I talk about in the book. People who accomplish modest-sized changes in the system have a map to know which people to waste time on and which people to avoid, even though they seem to be at the center of power. For those of you out there with a gleam in your eye saying, I've heard that idea before, you're right. You heard that idea in Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan, written in the first quarter of the 17th century, in which Hobbes says that wherever power seems to be, that you can be sure is not where it is. And the whole shtick, sort of an Eastern Yiddish word, the whole shtick of getting anything accomplished is actually not to beat your head against the ladders of authority because they don't lead to the authority. It's to discover where the authority is and home in on that. So the politics of schooling. And of course, each one of these compartments of supposed power have to be paid off. That's why these these darn government schools are so expensive. Look, here's just one example from my experience. Uh, in the last school I taught in, uh, I was given a former science room on the third floor of the building for my room. I'm saying a former science room on purpose because those huge slate uh, tables with uh, sinks in were still in the room. But sometime during the school year, some the custodian came in and removed all those desks. What he didn't notice, or probably was just indifferent about is, that the legs had been embedded in the floor, and when he removed the desks, in some places, there were holes that went straight down to the next classroom. 
And so my kids, being an enterprising lot, would make spitballs, and dare I say it, would even wad up used toilet paper and drop it through those holes into the screaming class beneath. Eventually this reached the principal's ears and he came to my door and he said, I demand that you stop that. And I said, I asked for permission to stop it. It would have taken 10 minutes. I'd go out and buy some patches and I'd put them down myself over these holes and that would be the end of the temptation. But I was informed by the custodian that that was illegal. So he stormed out of the room and then he came back and he said, right, you have to go through the chain of command. Okay, I said, start me on this procedure of getting these holes repaired. But don't ask me to stand over these holes because they're all over the room. And if I look one way, the stuff will get down another hole. They're dropping also ball bearings down those holes, which is really smart when they bounce off your noggin. So the custodian wouldn't tell me this, but eventually by dint of gruesome research, I discovered how many sign-offs had to be made before a team was dispatched from 25 miles away in Brooklyn to come and fix that repair. Eight separate levels of authority had to sign off on that, beginning with the custodian of my building and then the principal. But there were still six hoops to jump through, and then they didn't come. I misspoke. They didn't come to fix the holes. They came to inspect the problem. I want you to say the whole procedure took eight months for work that any journeyman could have finished in a half an hour, including purchasing the supplies to do it. And duplicate that experience by thousands and thousands of repairs in, in, in the thousand odd schools in New York City that are under the central system. And now are we just beginning to see a glimmer of how this power system has been set up to guarantee that nobody can change the inexorable progress and product of mass forced schooling. Absolutely fascinating. The last chapter is called Breaking Out of the Trap. And I'll just read the epigraph. The only conceivable way to emerge from this trap from which no further human, oh, I found a typo, progress is possible is to repudiate centralization of schooling in the form of national goals, national tests, national teaching licenses, school-to-work plans, and the rest of the utopian package, which in California is daily being tried out here and there. You guys are you guys are among the most villainous states in the country. I'd say the only one that matches the damage that California does is Texas, home of the legendary, well, I won't say it. This isn't a political program. Uh, you dictate textbook construction for the whole United States, and the reason for it is simple. Rather than fragment textbook buying so that teams of salesmen would be traveling constantly all over the state trying to sell their product, you bulk buy for this nation of 35 million people so that anyone who gets a contract to supply California with books gets a contract to supply California with millions of books. It's instant wealth. 
Well, because of that, no textbook publisher wants to make 19 versions of his book. What California wants, or what Texas wants, because they do the same thing, is then force-fed to the rest of the United States. And what you have wanted for all my lifetime is not in books that train the intellect. You've bought, wanted books that propagandize the spirit, that socialize children. Your books are riddled with errors, some of them so comic that if I say them, you won't believe them. When I went to my first uh, job away from uh, the East Coast, it was in Portland, Oregon, and the textbook that was available for history in the high schools of Portland, Oregon, was the same one available uh, in California it was by Scott Forsman and among the 258 major errors in the book was that the United States had dropped the atomic bomb on Korea. Now we're probably likely to do that in the upcoming days but but certainly I guess they felt that all those people from that part of the world look alike what's the difference Japan, Korea, uh, there were hundreds of errors of that magnitude in the book, nor was there any particular consternation when this was exposed. I guess there were some screams on the part of parents. But what does it matter? you got to get the kids to sit, be quiet, copy notes off the board, and pass tests. What does it matter whether the information is accurate or not? How old-fashioned do you want to be? Breaking out of the track, you have to repudiate centralization. Schooling must be desystematized. The system must be put to death. Rather than dismissing that as rhetoric, each one of us, if you value individuality, has a system of our own, just as we have a fingerprint of our own there. It's not totally alien to everyone else's system. But the part of our lives we value is, in fact, the part that that stands apart from the other people we know, or at least that's the part we should value as Americans. When you force everyone's system into one large system that presumes to distribute rewards later on based on how well you conform, we're talking about a nightmare that we are the chief distributor of this nightmare to the rest of the world, not communist China, not ex-communist Russia, but us should make you sit up and steam and vow to sabotage this system any way you can, any way you can. So that's the last chapter in the book. It says, Adam Smith correctly instructed us, you know, the high priest of the libertarians and the conservatives, he correctly instructed us for more than two centuries that the wealth of nations is the product of freedom, not of tutelage, not of someone telling you this is the right way to do something. Smith said that the more people you bring to the bargaining table, the more likely it is that in that steamy exchange of points of view that an entirely different idea that no one had thought of before springs free as the resultant of this dialectical process. I've never met somebody who cites Adam Smith, and they're all over California, who actually read his books. And while you're reading Wealth of Nations, which says bring everybody on board in a policy sense, read his theory of moral sentiments, in which he says that the people who devote their lives to making money 
are insane. They have wretched lives as a result of that. But we should all thank them for having devoted the substance of their lives to con constructing these structures that produce rivers of wealth. As I said, I've never met anybody, but I'm only 70, who's actually read Adam Smith. He's well worth reading. Uh, so, so the connection between the corporate economy, national politics, and schooling isn't a disease of free enterprise. It's a disease of collectivism, which must be broken if children are to become sovereign, creative adults capable of lifting a free society to unimaginable heights. The rational management model has damaged the roots of our free society and the free market that it claims to defend. And then I have an epilogue. That's only two pages, but you only get a little bit of it. What happened in our schools was foreseen way before we had them by Thomas Jefferson. We have been recolonized through the 20th century in a second American revolution. We have been reabsorbed into the ruling imagination of Tudor England. It's time to take our script from this country's revolutionary start. It's time to renew our traditional hostility toward hierarchy and tutelage. We became a unique nation from the bottom up, not from the top down. That's the only way to rebuild a worthy purpose for American education and a worthy destiny for our children. And I summon on stage in the epilogue two people. General Braddock in charge of the largest British army in North America and his subaltern, Major George Washington. Braddock is an aristocrat to the core, and he's on a huge white horse. And he's covered with red and gold and silver and drummers. And Washington is dressed in frontier buckskins on a horse called Blueskin, who's a gray. And both of them are beckoning us into a different future. One says, you are children. You will always be children. We will take care of you. Follow me into this well-organized, fully ordained future. And Washington, who said in his memoirs, that the most brilliant sight he ever saw in his life was Braddock's army about to be exterminated when it crossed the river that Washington said, I don't think I'd cross that river if I were you. He made a mistake because in my reading of American history, when he looked in the mirror, that was the most brilliant sight he ever saw. Like Caesar, he was offered a crown three times, and three times he turned it down and said, I'll return to private life after my presidency. I think we need to follow Blueskin into the future. And that's Underground History of American Education. And I hope you buy it. <laughs> Thank you very much, John.